While analog distortion is simply a natural reaction to overdriving an analog circuit, digital emulations of analog distortion must be specifically programmed to sound like analog distortion. And that's not a simple task. That's why I invited Universal Audio to sponsor this video, because they're known to be among the best at creating faithful emulations of analog gear. Digital audio isn't completely free of its own drawbacks, though. One of the most important limitations of digital audio is aliasing. A digital audio system can only accurately sample frequencies up to the Nyquist limit, which is half the sample rate in a digital audio system. So in a 48 kilohertz sample rate session, no frequencies beyond 24 kilohertz can be properly sampled. That's why the input of your interface contains low pass filtering so that the ultra high frequencies can be removed before being digitized. When you distort a signal in the digital domain, the high frequency harmonics that are excited can very easily reach the Nyquist limit. And once they do, they'll fold back into the audio spectrum as aliasing. And unfortunately, these artifacts won't necessarily stick to a musical harmonic series that's pleasing to our ears. Listen to the aliasing that occurs when using a stock DAW distortion plugin on a sine sweep. The signal alone looks like this on a spectrogram, a straight line from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz with equal energy throughout. But when I distort the signal with this simple distortion plugin, the harmonics quickly exceed Nyquist and turn into very obvious aliasing. Have a listen to the before and after. In a truly analog piece of equipment, there's no need to worry about aliasing because nothing is being sampled. The higher frequencies that arise with harmonic distortion in the outboard gear will simply be filtered out by the time they reach the input of your A to D converter. More advanced plugins have a feature called oversampling that will use an internal sample rate that's much higher than the session sample rate, increasing the Nyquist limit. You can see here that the aliasing that occurs within this UA plugin will be attenuated rapidly before returning to the audible range, which makes the aliasing problem much less noticeable. With more and more excessive distortion, there's just nothing that can be done to completely solve this problem, but oversampling certainly helps in most situations. Another difference between analog and digital processing is latency. One example of where latency becomes a problem is when you're monitoring the input audio signal in real time while performing. Signals in an analog system travel at about 70% the speed of light, which for humans is effectively instantaneous at any practical distance. This means that the sound from your vocal microphone will reach your ears and your headphones at the instant you sing into the microphone, which is how we're used to hearing ourselves. This makes for a more comfortable experience for the performer, which is one of the most important elements to capturing a great performance. With digital audio systems, there's always a bit of latency or delay. This is especially true if you want to process the signal that's being monitored. In a typical interface with a DAW setup, the signal would need to go into the interface, through the DAW and plugins, and back out of the interface to the headphones. This processing and transport all takes time, which can add up. Assuming your computer is capable of operating with a low buffer size, it's unlikely that performers will be able to detect these tiny delays but setting a low buffer size often means that the session can have fewer active plugins. This is one reason why many engineers will run a signal through an analog compressor and mixing console before splitting it to go to the DAW for recording and to the performer's headphones for monitoring. But few of us can afford a nice console and a rack of outboard gear. Some audio interfaces have internal DSP that helps with this problem. The Universal Audio Apollo interfaces, for example, have internal processors that allow us to use these analog hardware emulations we've discussed in real time with very low latency. So you can use more advanced processing like compression, reverb, and EQ even in your monitoring mix. If your interface doesn't have an internal DSP, another option would be to use the direct monitoring button that sends the input signal to the headphones without going through the DAW first. The problem here is that you'll only hear the dry signal unaffected by the plugins in your DAW session. 
The built-in analog compressor within the Volt 276 can be used here to control dynamics for both the recording and the monitor mix. Because this is an analog compressor, it introduces no latency, and the effect can be heard when using direct monitoring on the interface. This reminds me, there's actually one more important reason that many engineers work with a compressor or EQ in the signal chain while recording. In today's digital world, we have a tendency to save all of the mixing for the end. This is especially true for those of us who are born in the digital age. Young engineers tend to have a fix it in post mentality, as if all of the problems in the sound should be fixed after the recording is over. But there's a lot to be gained by making decisions earlier in the production process. If we learn to sculpt our recordings from the beginning, we'll have a clearer vision of the sound we're building, and we'll usually end up with better results in the end. Click the video that's on your screen now if you want to learn how to do this in your next recording session. I'll see you there.